Hey, 11 years ago, Eric Metaxas penned this book, Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. It's a biography of German Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He lived from 1906 to 1945. Bonhoeffer was a pivotal figure in Germany resisting the Nazification of the church. Metaxas' 600-page volume here, it follows him uh, to his murder at the age of 39, just a few days before Germany's surrender. Bonhoeffer's thinking had an, it to travel an enormous distance. Germany had a state church, and with the rise of the Third Reich, German Christians had arrived at the inevitable moment requiring the strictest church-state separation, a test that many would fail. His experience may be the single most needful thing for us to understand in our day as we face the incursion of the state into the church. Hitler was voted into power via a democratic election, and he took office in very early 1933. Less than a month later, his minions burned the Reichstag, and through an emergency declaration and the following synchronization, they called it, he ruled from then on until his death. He ruled pretty much by emergency decree. The Nazis worked relentlessly to take over the church, with most Germans quite happy with their new leader. Nor was it long before rules were made requiring all pastors to take an oath of obedience to the Fuhrer. Now, I'm going to read you the oath, but I, I don't take the oath, okay? Right? That's a big difference, right? So here it is. I swear that I will be faithful and obedient to Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer of the German Reich, and people, that I will conscientiously observe the laws and carry out the duties of my office, so help me God. Man, could you imagine taking that kind of an oath? But that was the oath. Now, this may sound comical to you, but I want you to realize that while pastors, many pastors were arrested and they refused, but many were imprisoned. Most took the oath. But even before this came a crisis over what was called the Aryan Paragraph. It was a new government rule which barred Jews from state-affiliated institutions. So now, all this I'm going to tell you right now happened in, in 1933. After a, the April 7 introduction of this rule, Metaxas here describes its expansion. On April 22, Jews were prohibited from serving as patent lawyers and Jewish doctors from working in institutions with state-run insurance. Jewish children were affected too. On April 25, strict limits were placed on how many of them could attend public schools. On May 6th, the laws were expanded to include all honorary university professors, lecturers, and notaries. In June, all Jewish dentists and dental technicians were prohibited from working with state-run insured institutions. By the fall, the laws included the spouses of non-Aryans. On September 29, Jews were banned from all cultural and entertainment activities, including the worlds of film, theater, literature, and the arts. In October, all newspapers were placed under Nazi control, expelling Jews from the world of journalism. Now, in the church, even ordained pastors having Jewish descent were fired. By 1935, all members of church congregations who had Jewish lineage were banned from worship attendance. They couldn't enter the building. Can you believe it? Bonhoeffer early and clear-headedly opposed in the church these ungodly rules. I'm going back now a notch. In March of 1933, he presented this essay called The Church and the Jewish Question. I want you to consider this extended description by Metaxas. Listen. Quote, If the state is creating excessive law and order, then the state develops its power to such an extent that it deprives Christian preaching and Christian faith of their rights. Bonhoeffer called this a grotesque situation. The church, he said, must reject this encroachment of the order of the state precisely because of its better knowledge of the state and of the limitations of its action. The state which endangers the Christian proclamation negates itself. Bonhoeffer then famously enumerated three possible ways in which the church can act toward the state. The first, already mentioned, was for the church to question the state regarding its actions and their legitimacy, to help the state be the state as God has ordained. The second way, and here he took a bold leap, was to aid the victims of state action. He said that the church has an unconditional obligation to the victims of any ordering of society, and before that sentence was over, he took another leap far bolder than the first. In fact, some ministers walked out. By declaring that the church has an unconditional obligation to the victims of any ordering of society, 
even if they do not belong to the Christian community. Everyone knew that Bonhoeffer was talking about the Jews, including Jews who were not baptized Christians. Bonhoeffer then quoted Galatians, quote, do good to all men, unquote, to say that it's unequivocally the responsibility of the Christian church to help all Jews was dramatic, even revolutionary, but Bonhoeffer wasn't through yet. The third way the church can act toward the state, he said, is not just to bandage the victims under the wheel, but to put a spoke in the wheel itself. The translation is awkward, but he meant that a stick must be jammed into the spokes of the wheel to stop the vehicle. It is sometimes not enough to help those crushed by the evil actions of a state. At some point, the church must directly take action against the state to stop it from perpetrating evil. This, he said, is permitted only when the church sees its very existence threatened by the state and when the state ceases to be the state as defined by God. Bonhoeffer added that this condition exists if the state forces the exclusion of baptized Jews from our Christian congregation or in the prohibition of our mission to the Jews." Unquote. Now, this was utterly shocking to most who heard or read it, yet it was so timely. Now, here's a question for us. Is there application for God's people today? So, it's March 2022 as I'm preparing this. At this moment, we seem to be in an interim. In many places, there's a respite from the restrictions imposed on citizens in the past 24 months. But can we be sure that the state would not pressure us to compromise our faith by, well, I don't know, by barring from our worship or our employ those who are, let's say, unvaccinated or those who choose not to wear masks? Would, would, that, would the state do that to us? Would different corporations, uh, would different religious entities do that to us? 89 years ago, Bonhoeffer came face to face with that which has come in our day, the incursion of state power into the space God has allotted to his church. But as one penetratingly wrote in 1996, quote, anyone looking for black shirts, mass parties, or men on horseback will miss the telltale clues of creeping fascism. In any first world country of advanced capitalism, the new fascism will be colored by national and cultural heritage, ethnic and religious composition, formal political structure, and your political environment. In America, it would be super modern and multi-ethnic, as American as Madison Avenue, executive luncheons, credit cards, and apple pie. It would be fascism with a smile. And he went on to say this, I am worried by those who fail to remember or have never learned that big business, big government partnerships backed up by other elements were the central facts behind the power structures of old fascism in the days of Mussolini, Hitler, and the Japanese empire builders." Unquote. Bonhoeffer anticipates for us these dilemmas because he actually faced very similar dilemma. It was not long before much of the German Lutheran church had been essentially Nazified. Now, Bonhoeffer, along with figures like Karl Barth, had part in preparing something called the Barman Declaration. You might have heard of it. There's a city in Germany called Barman, and a group of theologians and pastors and church people got together, and there they created the Barman Declaration. So I'm going to share with you just a couple of examples from the Barman Declaration uh, given here by Metaxas. Quote, we reject the false doctrine as though they were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords, areas in which we would not need justification and sanctification through him. Now, here's another one. Quote, we reject the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message and order to its own pleasure or to changes in prevailing ideological and political convictions. Unquote. Now, what? What Bonhoeffer is saying is that the church can't just put its finger in the wind and just change its message because suddenly we're getting pressure from the government to do it this way, or we're getting pressure from the government to do that. The church can't just change its message because uh, the state media or the dominant group of doctors or something wants this or wants that. The, the church is bound by the scriptures. We're bound to follow Jesus. And that's always, always, always our starting point. It's pretty good that, you know, Bonhoeffer kept on working on this because if you go back before this, at another earlier point in time, Bonhoeffer had also participated in the drafting of 
what was going to be called that time, the earlier time, it was going to be called the Bethel Confession. But Metaxas tells us what happened with, with that. Listen, quote, After three weeks of work, Bonhoeffer was satisfied, but then the document was sent to 20 eminent theologians for their comments. By the time they were through, every bright line was blurred, every sharp edge of difference filed down, and every point blunted. Bonhoeffer was so horrified that he refused to work on the final draft. When it was completed, he refused to sign it. As would happen so often in the future, he was deeply disappointed by the inability of his fellow Christians to take a definite stand. They always erred on the side of conceding too much and trying too hard to ingratiate themselves with their opponents. The Bethel Confession had become a magnificent waste of words. So now later, after the Barman Declaration, there was a split and the Confessing Church was, was formed. But the river of blood that was Nazi Germany continued to flow, and Bonhoeffer, all through these years, continued to resist in various ways. For part of the time, he was running illegal seminaries. He had groups, small groups of theology students, young workers that were going to be pastors, and he trained them the best he could and kept setting up these illegal seminaries. And I'm just cutting the story a little bit short, but Bonhoeffer also uh, was involved with a group of people, finally, uh, toward the end, who actually were planning the assassination of Adolf Hitler. Bonhoeffer had a degree of involvement there, and he was eventually arrested. And he spent, most of his last months were spent in prison. And he was hanged just before the end of the war. Now, it's difficult to know how best to morally evaluate everything Dietrich Bonhoeffer participated in. How many of us have faced the kinds of decisions that he faced? Maybe not too many. Yet, as we look to not just the future, but to, to the present, his legacy is important to us. The state encroached and the church mostly complied. Bonhoeffer resisted inhumanities against Jews and others, while so many, quote, spiritual leaders were carried along both mentally and emotionally with, with the flow. See, public-private partnerships operating in Germany created some of the darkest moments in our history, moments many have forgotten. And in these, our dread days, workers are needed who understand the times and who know how intelligently to deploy their vertebrae in service to His Majesty, King Jesus. So here's the book, Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. It's got quite a few pages. There's so much to learn from his experience. I recommend this book for those who are ready to take on a large volume and who are willing to think differently. We also do a podcast, an audio podcast, a couple a week on soft totalitarianism. Here's a link to a video that tells you about that. You're welcome to come and subscribe to that. But anyway, here's the book. Another positive one. I think you should, should be up to date on Bonhoeffer, whether it's through this book or another item, another book of some kind maybe a shorter book, but I found this to be pretty stimulating and very apropos for the times we live in today.